Good afternoon, everybody. If I have your attention, please, we're going to get this program underway. Um, I think most of you know my name is Willen Bowden. I'm Executive Director of the Potomac Center for National Security, one of your co-host organizations for the day, uh, along with our valued partner and sister organization, the Strauss Center for International Security and Law. Um, uh, all of you have seen our speaker's very impressive bio, uh, which I could spend the next half hour going over and would barely scratch the surface of his tremendous accomplishments. Uh, but uh, just a couple of things to highlight. General Vince Brooks uh, most recently retired as a four-star from the Army after commanding all of our U.S. forces in Korea. And uh, we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about his experience and insights from, um, from that. Uh, but that capped off, uh, like I said, a very extensive career of serving, serving, serving our nation, uh, several previous commands, uh, and beginning in his life as a, as a real pioneer, the, um, uh, the first African American we showed so as the first captain of this class at West Point. And any of our West Point grads in the room or, or other active duty army will, will appreciate the significance of that. Uh, I would be remiss in uh, not mentioning that his, uh, his better half, uh, Mrs. Carol Brooks, is also here. And she is a Longhorn and a from here. Um, and the, the, niece, uh, the niece of Professor Perry, who the PCL Library is named after. So uh, we are so honored to have both of them here. And finally, I will announce for the first time publicly, we'll be sending this out next week, that General Brooks is joining the Clements and Strauss Centers as a distinguished senior fellow. So this is his debut performance. Uh, and so it's not <laughs> say a special welcome to our listening audience on our Horns of a Dilemma podcast, which is this, this conversation is being recorded for, another way to disseminate uh, our, our uh, activities and national security initiatives here at the University of Texas at Austin to a broader national and international audience. So, uh, so I'm going to have a, a structured conversation with General Brooks for the first bit of our time here, uh, but then after that we'll be turning over to questions from the audience, so please be thinking about any questions you might have for him. General, let's start with uh, your own background and career path. You come from a military family. Uh, when and why did you decide that you wanted to pursue a career in the Army? Well, well first, uh, let me just say thanks for inviting me to do this. It's a great privilege to be with you and uh, with everyone who's here today. Thanks, everyone, for turning out. And I, I'll try not to ruin my opportunities on my debut, my debut <laughs> moment. So. Uh, you know, actually, I, I do come from a military background. My father was a career Army officer and uh, ultimately rose to the rank of Major General. And because of that, I absolutely did not want to go into the military. <laughs> and so, uh, like many young, rebellious uh, teenagers, I wanted to do the opposite. So I, I wanted to go into medicine. And I had always been studying medical subjects and things. I had models of airplanes and models of human anatomy when I was a child, and uh, was studying Gray's anatomy from a very early age. And I have to say that my wife, Carol Perry Brooks, is uh, also an Army kid, and she swore she and her sister, Rob, her sister Robin Perry Searles, who's sitting beside her there, both UT graduates, by the way, swore that they would never marry a military man or a doctor. So <laughs> I almost got both of those in getting Carol to reverse her position. But really, the bottom line is, uh, sometime in my junior year of high school, uh, I began to get an interest in military medicine. I was going to go that way. And then my brother got an appointment to West Point. He's a year older than I am. And came back six months later a very different person. And I really liked what I saw. I, you know, I loved my brother and loved him uh, dearly then as well, but uh, he was very different. And it appealed to me that maybe, maybe that really is what I want to do. And so in my senior year, already late to apply, I, uh, I said, I, uh, I want to go to West Point also. And became uh, you know, an applicant in the process. I would have good grades, I was already a student leader, I was an athlete, and so I had all the, the things going for me that would uh, get me admission. Uh, but I didn't really have a way to accelerate the process. And so my brother boldly went to go see the head coach of the basketball team and say, hey, my brother wants to come to West Point. He's a pretty good basketball player. His name was Mike Krzyzewski, so I, <laughs> I got recruited to play at West Point by Coach K. Saw him very well. He hasn't has amounted to much. Obviously, the winningest coach in, in college basketball. Uh, but he was kind enough to pursue that, and I ended up getting accelerated into West Point as a recruited athlete. But ultimately, 
I found that going to West Point where everyone was at the top of their class academically and everyone was a student body president and everyone was the captain of, of, of their sports team or multiple sports teams, someone was going to be at the front of that group and someone was not going to be at the front of that group uh, or even at the very end of it. A very competitive environment where we were graded every single day in every single class. A very competitive academic environment. And I wasn't doing as well as I was accustomed to doing. And so uh, after a year on the varsity basketball team as a freshman, I asked Coach K if I could lead the team and concentrate on the academic and military portions of West Point. Uh, and he said, is that really what you want to do? And I said, yes, Coach, it is. It's a hard decision. I mean, I feel like I'm abandoning you after you recruited me in here. He says, I'll support you. And so I learned a lot then. That really accelerated me in my concentration on the academic side. I was on the dean's list, list the next semester. And then ultimately rose the, uh, the top ranking military position that a cadet can hold uh, in charge of 4,000 of my classmates, the entire core cadet student body, and in a position previously held by people like Douglas MacArthur and Jonathan Wainwright and Robert E. Lee and others. So it was a very prominent position and being a history maker inside of that. So that's what brought me to West Point and brought me to a career as a leader uh, for our nation. And I haven't looked back. Uh, and obviously, I've transitioned now into retirement as of the 1st of January. And I'm trying to understand how can I continue to serve and give back. And being a fellow of the center lets me do that. So that's my journey. OK, well, we have Coach K's losses our game. So <laughs> and we, we have a partnership with Duke, too. So I will be sure that our friends will be here. <laughs> <laughs> But I do, do want to continue on that theme of being, being a trailblazer. Obviously, the first African American chosen to be first captain of your class in West Point, um, just the uh, eighth African American uh, to uh, attain the rank of four stars in the US military. Tell me, how well does the US military do in promoting uh, racial diversity uh, opportunity? And related, did you have any particular role models in your own past? Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the work being done by the US military, and certainly my own branch, the Army. Uh, it's a roller coaster ride like all of American history is, because the opposite could have been said about the Army in some of its years. Uh, but because of the Army's uh, efforts to lead change in our society, and I believe they've done it very, very well, uh, I was able to go to West Point. I, my father, as I mentioned, was able to continue to advance through the ranks, having entered just after President Truman issued the order to desegregate the armed forces. But trust me, a, a, a de jure uh, desegregation does not equal a de facto desegregation. And so he experienced, as did my father-in-law, their, their father, uh, retired Colonel Mervyn Perry, also an Army officer, came up through that period, uh, through the 1950s, through the 60s, 70s, and both of them retired in the 1980s. That's a long journey to see change in the United States, and they are witness to the progress that our military service has made leading the way for our society in many ways. So now it's very different. Uh, in fact, next week I'll go to West Point and I will be a keynote speaker at the Diversity and Inclusion Conference there. And the fact that there is such a conference, trust me, that's a big change. At a very traditional institution that's been around since 1802, unhindered by, by progress. <laughs> that's, that's a joke that we say about ourselves here, but the reality is they progress considerably. And remember, I was in the first class that included women at West Point. And what a privilege that was. We were confused about it at first in 1976, the 200th anniversary of the, the United States independence. So we were the class of 76 uh, entering West Point and the class of 80 exiting West Point. And I was probably among those who was resistant to the idea at first until I learned what I was missing and what West Point had been missing. Now we see there are far more women graduates of West Point than there are African American graduates already. And uh, the, uh, the achievements that have been made there by the, the, the women students, graduates, uh, and the things they're doing now in their careers, which are very diversified in the effects that they've had, absolutely tremendous. Same thing with all of the diverse categories that we want to consider. So racial diversity, ethnic diversity, gender diversity, sexual diversity, uh, all those things, so sexuality diversity, I should be more precise. All that now exists in the Corps Cadets at West Point. And that's uncomfortable for old timers, but it is an indication of leading change as opposed to following change. And so I'm very proud of it. I'm, I'm proud of the military, and I, I like to see that that's happening in other places as well, like the University of Texas. 
So most of our conversation today, uh, shifting into the uh, current events and, and policy and strategy realm, is going to focus on your most recent command of all U.S. forces in Korea and your expertise on security issues in Asia. But um, can you please explain to our audience the uh, the unique role you had there uh, in in South Korea? Really triple headed, commanding all U.S. forces, uh, commanding Korean forces. Uh, and then commanding U UN forces. Um, so how did that work? What did that mean? To whom did you report? Um, and what's that tell us about the American presence on the Korean Peninsula? It's really a great question. I'm going to try to keep this relatively brief and as uncomplicated as I can. But as you can imagine, with three different commands living in the same person and in the same people who are part of the staff, but having three different authorities and three different reporting chains, yet in the exact same place, the same environment. That can be a little bit complicated so, uh, sometimes. So let me, let me build a little bit of a watch here. Uh, first, we begin with the United Nations Command. That's the oldest of the three commands. By the way, the three are United Nations Command, the uh, United States Forces Korea Command, and the combined command of the United States and the Republic of Korea. So it's three distinct entities. The oldest of them is, uh, is, is the United Nations Command, created in 1950 by a Security Council resolution. Literally, Russia was out of the room when it passed, and so the permanent five, you know, one miss, dare not go to the bathroom if you're in the United Nations Security <laughs> Council. But that led to the creation of this command, and then a few days later, a decision by the UN Security Council to pass the lead to the United States. The first commander appointed into this position was General Douglas MacArthur, so I've had the privilege of following in his footsteps several times, and that's one of them. Uh, so he was the first UN commander, and an international response to the North Korean invasion into South Korea, of course, uh, an artificial dividing line that separated North and South uh, at the end of World War II in 1945, left two spheres of influence, a Russian sphere of influence in the North, and a communist country emerged there, and an American sphere of influence in the South. And ostensibly a democracy emerged there. It was a different kind of democracy at that point in time. So that command has been around since then. It was the warfighter from 1950 to 1953, during the hot years of the war, and we got a Korean War veteran here in the back who served from 52 to 54. In 53, an armistice was signed. It's a military agreement to stop the con uh, combat and to back up two kilometers in each direction. It did not create peace. Okay, so it's an unstable condition that was intended to be temporary until a stable condition of peace could emerge. That was 1953. <laughs> this is a long condition of temporary, and as a result, the UN command has been the keeper of the armistice to ensure that both sides are adhering to it it's the entity that uh, used to meet with the Chinese People's Volunteers, who have now withdrawn from Korea entirely, and the North Korea People's Army, which is still the other side of the line. South Korea had a member in that commission uh, that created the armistice, but is not a signatory, which is very important as we think about what's happening now. And we can talk about that as we get further into that. So that's the United Nations Command at the present time. It is still the home for international commitment. Uh, there are 16 countries that still provide either staff officers or non-commissioned officers and periodically forces to come to Korea, but that's where they would come if there were to be a call for uh, return of arms, which there has not been thanks to United Nations Command to prevent that from being a resumption. So UN Command is about stopping war and preventing a resumption of war, and it reports through the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff to the United States leadership because the United States is the lead nation. And that's a multinational body. Then we have uh, the, uh, let's go to the Republic of Korea, the United States Combined Forces Command. That's a long name. It's better known as CFC, Combined Forces Command. And everyone in Korea knows about CFC. It is the prominent entity militarily in Korea. It is the war fighting command now, having taken that responsibility away from United Nations Command in 1978. So it's an outgrowth of UN Command. Same trunk, different branch. And its responsibilities are for the defense of the Republic of Korea. It's the living uh, expression of the uh, Mutual Defense Treaty, and it's unique in the world 
among our seven alliances, there's only one that has a standing combined command. That means that there are Koreans and Americans in the same headquarters, in the same staff. An American commands it, an American four-star general commands it, and a South Korean four-star general is the number two deputy commander of that. And together, in wartime, they control all the U.S. forces who are committed. Starts with about 28,500 to 30,000 on a day-to-day -day basis, but expands to uh, several hundred thousand Americans in wartime. And then there are 620,000 Koreans on a day-to-day -day basis defending their country, and that expands to three million in wartime. All of those forces from the two countries are under a single command, and that is the Republic of Korea United States Combined Forces Command. When you hear about exercises being done, that's who's exercising. That's, that's the entity that is supposed to keep a sharp edge on its sword and is the one that will be used in a time of war. If I can interject yeah. real quick just to make sure everyone here appreciates that. So the sovereign nation of South Korea willingly puts 620,000 of their active duty forces under the command of an American general. That tells you something about the strength of that alliance and the trust that South Korea puts in, in the United States. Yes, and in your near future, uh, there will be a decision to transfer that control. So you'll see that sometimes in the news talking about operational control of forces in wartime or OPCON transfer, where the South Korean will be in charge of all that. And this has significant geopolitical ramifications and, and uh, it, it matters a lot in several countries. Let me just say quickly that the reporting chain on that particular command, the combined command, is binational. So there is a structure for decision making that leads from the commander, who happens to be an American, through the joint staff of each country. So South Korea has a joint chief of staff, just like the United States, it's mirrored in structure, to the two secretaries or ministers of, the, of defense, and then to the two presidents. So I, I always had, on any given day, two presidents. It actually went through four presidents during my time, because there was a transition of power in both countries during my time. The last one is uh, the, uh, the US Forces Korea Command, USFK, as it's sometimes uh, described. That is a unilateral, US-only command that has Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines in it. So often we have an event that uh, someone plays an Armed Forces medley, people see me stand up for all of them. I thought you were in the Army. And that's true. I, I had a career in the Army, and I love the Army, and I'm a soldier for life. That's what that means. But I have all four forces underneath my command, and I stand for each one of them because they stood for me. And so that command is how the U.S. expresses its presence and its commitment to South Korea. And its chain runs from Korea to Hawaii, where the geographic commander of all of the Indo-Pacific resides. That's a Navy four-star admiral. Army works with the Navy in that regard. We don't like that always, but we can accept it in this case. <laughs> and then uh, that, that goes then forward from him to the Secretary of Defense as the direct chain of command. In wartime, we break that line, and Korea reports directly to the Secretary of Defense. And as we uh, get into this, we'll see that uh, the challenging circumstances of 2016 and 17 uh, meant I had a lot of time dealing directly with the Secretary of Defense. Those are the three commands, and those are the three chains, and, and skillfully using one where it has authority and sidelining one when it doesn't have authority was how we made it through 2017 into 2018. And we're going to get into that in a little more detail. Um, but uh, let's uh, one more question about the American presence there. Um, so the Korean War, you know, active hostilities, you know, tech, uh, you know, ended in 1953. The fight ended in 1953. Just an armistice, a cease, uh, ceasefire, a cease troop peace treaty. You know, over 65 years later, the United States still has roughly 30,000 troops there. I know, depending on the inflows. Given the ongoing debates we're having as a country today about our military posture and our, our presence overseas. Is that a failure or a success of U.S. policy that 65 years later we still have a substantial troop presence? It depends on how you look at it. Now, I'll, I'll tell you how it looks to me. Okay. Uh, having done this in several parts of the world, been deployed at the front end of the combat operations and really at the tail end, which is what Korea is. Now, this will never work from a position of saying this is a policy stance. But it takes two to three generations to see change, to see the effect of your commitment there in the first place. You don't do that in five years, 
You don't do that in six months. Nothing about this type of change is quick. And so our enduring presence in Korea and in Japan for that matter, we have multiple generations of presence there now, has changed both of those societies. And so for Korean War veterans, uh, I, I met with many of them as they came back in a program that South Korea sponsors a return of the, the war veterans, all the countries. They do a brilliant job of taking care of the veterans and treating them like the world they are. South Korea knows that their current condition is because of that international commitment led by the United States. And so it is very much a success in my view, but it demands a continuing attention to its support and its sustainment. Now the amount of troops there now are, are far fewer from the United States than there were in the years 1950 to 1953, far fewer. But that is no less a commitment. And so the enduring commitment is what helps to bring about success. Does anyone listen to K-pop? You probably do and don't even know it. Okay? K-pop is, is a form of pop music from Korea, but it's a genre that now has made it around the world. And that is a direct reflection of people listening to music from the American Forces radio and television service right outside the gates. That's where K-pop comes from. The Korean language that's used in South Korea is not the same as in North Korea. They need interpreters from time to time when they meet, believe it or not. Because the South Korean language is so infused with American words that it's another language now. The DNA of their military is our DNA. There is no denying that baby. That is our, that is our offspring, without a doubt. And I would, I would say also that the DNA of their democracy, it is a thriving democracy that went through an impeachment during my time and the military did not come out on the street. That thriving democracy is also our DNA. Now in my view, that is an immense success, but it's not finished because the country's not at peace. And so until there's peace, prosperity, security, stability, until we have all these dynamics, our work is not done. Now so this is how I view our presence. And a small number, 28,500 or so, compared to 620,000, very small number, still is a continuing pay down on the commitment. But the United States is still committed. And this has to be factored in when we think about what comes if there's success? What if there is peace? Does that mean the U.S. now withdraws all of its forces? Remember in Northeast Asia, we have a greater force presence than anywhere else in the world. Far greater. So there's 50,000 in Japan alone, and somewhere about 30,000 when it's all said and done, including rotational forces, who are in Korea. 80,000 or more troops in a very small military, active military in the United States, are committed to Northeast Asia. This is what it's really all about. How do you display commitment? I remember I had Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines under me, and each service has a different contribution to make. We send a very powerful signal when three aircraft carriers turn in my direction, sent uh, toward me at my request in Korea. That sends a very strong message to North Korea. But they left. And so it is power to be sure. And no one should ever question naval power of the United States. But it's a different kind of power. It's a power of interest as opposed to a power of commitment, which our land forces tend to create. So the combination of all these services is what sends the message. And the preponderant force there on the ground is still the United States Army, about 20,000 of those. Mm -hmm. So let me follow up on that, especially because you talked about our presence in, in Japan as well. Um, the, the American presence in the Asia and Pacific is, uh, is really built anchored by our alliance system, this hub and, hub and spoke alliance system, especially with allies, uh, Japan, South Korea, and Australia being the really key ones. I know we know Philippines and others are there too. Again, in our current political climate, a number of Americans, scholars, regular voters, are growing a little more skeptical of allies, or maybe weary of allies. Um, you know, our allies more of a burden than an asset. So, from your perspective, from a military perspective, from your commander's perspective, what are some of the things that the U.S. gains from our Asia alliances, and also what were some of the frustrations you had from dealing with allies? Well, there's an old expression that I think is attributed to Winston Churchill that says the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without them. And so uh, you have the two-sided coin of alliances. Now remember, the United States is pretty selective about alliances. We only have seven in the world. And NATO is one of those things. It's the largest collective alliance that we have 
but five of the seven are in the Indo-Asia Pacific region. South Korea and Japan are two prominent ones that are really both the cornerstone and the linchpin. Those are the words that are used to describe those two alliance relationships. Japan, U.S. is a cornerstone of security and prosperity in Northeast Asia. And the U.S.-Korea alliance is the linchpin of security and prosperity in our entire architecture for Northeast Asia. So these are very important to us. What we gain by that first is uh, an, an application of what the U.S. is abroad. Alliances tend to open the door to all that is America. Academics. Are there any uh, Koreans who study here at the University of Texas? Any in the room today? Uh, several here. Okay, so it opens the door to that. Civil society, example, culture, economic interaction, and we have some of the largest and strongest economies in the world that happen to have grown out of these two countries, both of which were devastated by war, and both of which were nurtured back to life by the United States. That's what the United States gets out of it. It's, it's what makes America great around the world. It's that we're present with others. And that's the case in any one of these alliances. In a time of crisis, obviously, what it gets is someone like the North Atlantic Treaty Organization deciding on the day after the, uh, our anniversary right now, the 9-11 attacks, that they would invoke Article 5 of the Mutual Defense Treaty. We didn't ask them to do that. They did because they were allies, because of the commitment and the investment the United States had for so many years prior to that being tested. In a time of war, you see allies showing up. Uh, I think about someone like Australia. Australia is one of our allies as part of the Australia, New Zealand, United States uh, alliance. And really everywhere since World War I, the United States has been in combat, Australia has been there also. Every one of them. Okay, so you can measure any place that you want to, you're going to find Aussie right there beside us. And they are small, they're a middle weight as we would call it, but trust me, they punch above their weight. And having the Aussies with you when you're going into action uh, is a good thing. And you never want to be on the opposite side. And then we can go around all the alliances to get that. What it opens then is a connection of the United States to the rest of the world. So I'm a fan of and a, a beneficiary of, in many ways, the alliance system. And this is under duress at the present time. China, Russia, both would seek to disrupt that international order that includes an alliance system. And we see that unfolding before our eyes right now. Any frustrations you ever had in dealing with allies? Realizing yes. that, you know, yeah, on balance, you know, the benefits are tremendous, but any frustrations? Well, I think the key benefit is something called uh, national caveat. Okay, so every nation in an alliance or even in a coalition will retain official command over its forces. In other words, it will decide what its forces will do, will not do, can do, could do. And that means that every single decision you're going to go through requires an invested commitment by those countries. And it may opt out. And so just when you think you're ready, they may say, uh, back in our parliament, this is not playing too well. So we will not be part of any coalition or alliance that is involved in regime change, for example. But several of our allies took that view. As soon as you finish the regime change, we'll be here. <laughs> no, we'll be just offshore, we'll be at an air base waiting to come in, but we're not part of this if regime change is involved. So the frustration that tends to come with alliances is that you must maintain a high degree of consensus and cooperation. And that's just difficult in human interaction at any point in time, much less when national interests and national blood and treasure are at stake. So I would say that's probably the most frustrating part. It's also the most rewarding part when it's all said and done. When you find someone that commits in a like-minded fashion their blood and treasure right alongside us, and we become bonded as one. I, I, trust me, I've been to too many memorials for our allies and partners around the world who were right there with us, and they were exposed to the same dangers, and they lost people who had to suffer that loss just like we did. And we shared that, 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 that feeling of loss with them at the same time, as they did with us when we lost Americans. And we even saw that last week with you know the loss of an American soldier in Afghanistan and uh, the same attack killed a Romanian soldier. Yes. Um, so, well, 
a lot of us probably didn't know that Romanian soldiers are there you know, fighting and dying alongside Americans in Afghanistan. Yes. And Romania was not attacked on 9-11. And yet they were because of Article 5 and their joining of the, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, let's shift now to uh, uh, North Korea and um, you're uh, uh, sometime in the locker, Kim Jong-un. So, um, so um, I was gonna say your friend, but let's not be too, uh, yeah, let's not be too can joke about that. So it's North Korea's nuclear, uh, especially the nuclear missile program, that gets a lot of headlines, and rightfully so, because that's what could potentially reach the continental United States. But Pyongyang's conventional forces uh, are considerable um, and complicates the situation in ways I think some Americans may not fully realize. What can you tell us about North Korea's conventional force capability, especially their you know, rockets and artillery tubes just across the DNC from Seoul, and how does that complicate uh, deterrence and diplomatic options? Well, we should recognize first that North Korea is the fourth largest military in the world. They're bigger than Russia. That's often lost. And this is before mobilization. So they expand to multi-millions. They're already 1.7 or 8 million already under arms on a given day. Now, in some cases, this is a job story. Can't do it. Uh, but they possess a, a formidable conventional arsenal heavily influenced by rockets, artillery, and mortars, and then augmented by the world's largest special operations force. Biggest one in the world. Now, how advanced they are with their systems, and technologically they're not that advanced in most areas, with the exception, notable exceptions that we've seen in the last uh, four or five years. Their nuclear technology is very advanced now. Their missile technology is increasingly advanced. It's gone from liquid fuel propellant to now solid fuel propellant. Their ability to achieve intercontinental range, we saw uh, back on the 29th of November, 2017. Uh, so they're increasingly sophisticated in their technology. They have one of the most formidable cyber forces in the world, about number five. So if you're gonna go to the top 10, they're well within it. And they actively use it for everything from protecting the regime to stealing money, which they do very, very well. Sony Pictures was attacked by North Korea, for example. And there are others that are attributed to North Korea, and we're pretty sure they're involved in it, but there's less public communication about it. They do go after banks in the US banking system. They are uh, highly effective at pursuing Bitcoin around the world, and have taken billions of dollars from other banks as a result of doing this. So conventional, asymmetric with special operations, nuclear forces, rocket forces, and, uh, and, and the like, makes North Korea very formidable. So how does that turn into deterrence? Well, how do you deter all that? Well, one is a degree of consistency. There's some deterrence that comes from the fact that the United States or the United Nations Command have not attacked North Korea since 1953. And so as much as uh, Kim Jong-un, the great chairman, speaks of the threat that comes from the South, especially with the United States commitment and the UN uh, back up to that, the fact of the matter is the armistice is held since 1953 because the UN command didn't attack. North Korea has attacked several times. We have several hundred people killed, Americans and South Koreans alike, and some, uh, some third nations in South Korea since the armistice signing. So it is not peace, trust me. It's a, it's a very contested period, especially when you look at the late 1960s, uh, 66 to 69, it was almost a second Korean War, but it didn't become that. So deterrence has to take the form of consistency and credibility. And so the credible capability, no matter what the number is, remember I, I said that commitment is what comes with that 28,500, the rest of the US is behind that. And so is the international community, because the United States is still leading United Nations Command. So these commands are the expression of uh, how to create a, a sense of deterrence over North Korea. Now, there are limits to military power, and that's very clear. If you're not actively conducting combat operations, then the limits are significant. If you are conducting active combat, uh, combat operations, the limits are still pretty significant. You don't have uh, uh, um, omniscience or um, the omnipresence or omnipotence to be able to try to affect all things against your adversary. That's not the case. Military is limited. 
And so it requires the military being used with other instruments of national and international power. Sometimes it's law enforcement. That can be very useful in deterring travel by proliferators from different countries, including North Korea. It can limit uh, things like the transfer of illicit materials. People can be arrested in other countries. So law enforcement becomes a very ins important uh, instrument of power. Diplomacy clearly has to be that. It's difficult to have diplomacy with a country that won't talk to you. And this is what 2016 and 17 were about using the military instrument in such a way that it created a better option for Kim Jong-un to choose diplomacy than the direction we were going, which was to ignore diplomacy, not have a conversation, and pursue military power. Uh, as the commander there, obviously that was what my duty was, uh, as assigned to me by the Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary Jim Mattis. We're trying to create an opportunity for traction for diplomacy to take effect, to take hold, initially with Secretary Tillerson and then with Secretary Pompeo, and of course with the South Koreans, and we succeeded on that. So diplomacy has to take those forms. A nuanced approach to the use of military instruments is the one thing I really want to focus on. You know, and we're not always taught that in, in our policy schools or in our military schools. We talk about working together, and we're really good in the United States at a whole of government approach compared to others, except for autocracies who do that very, very well, because they have control of the whole of government. But in a democracy that pursues whole of government approaches, it's much more difficult. It's like an alliance. Yeah. US government is an alliance in, 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 in many ways. So to create a consistent policy and have a credible uh, expression of that policy in military form and, and the other instruments, has been a challenge for us over the years. And as a result, our deterrence has slipped a number of times. Right now, I think we have deterrence against the use of nuclear weapons and further testing on nuclear weapons. But clearly, we don't have deterrence on the testing of conventional capabilities, as we've seen now 10 tests in the last two months. But where those are being used is a reflection of deterrence also. So deterrence is a degree of equilibrium. And both sides have to be satisfied that it's not tipping or spinning in some direction that's, that's detrimental to their interests. And it takes that form. It's not to create inactivity on both sides. It's an equilibrium of activity, in my experience. So um, since he's come up already, uh, let's talk about Kim Jong-un. Mm -hmm. What kind of person is he? I mean, this has obviously been a big riddle for American policymakers, for the intelligence community. Uh, you had you know, some pretty up-close uh, observations of him and spent a lot of time. What kind of person is he? What makes him tick? How secure is his hold on power? Uh, how predictable is he? Well, trust me, I got asked this question a lot in okay. 2016, especially when we had no conversation with him. He had no conversation with anyone in the world. Remember, this, this leader had been in power for several years at this point in time. And 2016, I guess, was his fourth or fifth year in power. And he had zero external connections with any other national leader. So the question was always, what kind of person is he? And Intelligence services around the world were trying to find that out. What kind of person is he really? Does he have his father's lifestyle habits where he tends to do everything to excess? Smoking, drinking, womanizing, drug use, all these things were part of his father who opened this nuclear program, this nuclear can of worms in many ways. Was he different from his father? He had gone to school in Switzerland, had a little bit more of uh, external exposure to the rest of the world beyond the cocoon that North Korea is. You want to see a closed society, that's it. I mean, that's, that's the epitome of closed societies. And yet he'd been schooled outside of that. Was he like his siblings, some of whom were sophisticated, some of whom were slugs? Which, which one is he? What, what is he like? And that was an unknown. It was, an un, it was a known unknown to be Rumsfeldian here. <laughs> uh, we all now have some greater appreciation of who he is. I, I described him in 2016 as a quick learner, like a BMX bike rider who begins riding a tricycle. He is unafraid to fail in public and learn in public. In that regard, he is very un-Korean. He is ruthless. He killed his uncle with a 23 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. That's pretty ruthless. And there have been many more killed at his direction since that point in time, helping him to consolidate power. He is in control. 
of North Korea, but not universally so. He has to attend to his home constituency like any other leader does. And while he has instruments that he will use to maintain control that few others in the world, few other autocrats even, are using in the modern era, he does have to pay attention to public sentiment because his greatest fear is that there is an internal uprising that causes him to suddenly lose his grip on power where his people, the North Korean people, proletariat as they are, would suddenly decide this is too much even for us. And trust me, they have an extraordinarily high tolerance for pain. But they are not too far from that, that point. And so he's been very wise in many ways and savvy on releasing some controls that displace the power of the state and replace it with capitalist power. For example, there's, there's a, a movement called the Janmadan, which is a, it's a, a, a self-developed commercial market. People begin to do trading inside of North Korea and some dangerously cross outside of North Korea to trade goods and bring them back and do internal trading. The Janmadan is culturally antithetical to the form of socialism that North Korea has been preaching for <clears throat> all the generations that we can remember. And yet he's done this and hasn't lost power. In fact, he has released energy that uh, allows people to, to realize the state is not going to take care of them anymore. It can't. It fell apart during his father's time. And now if he's going to lead North Korea into a new direction, it has to go in a different direction than it is right now. So all these things are characteristics of Kim Jong-un. He's an opportunist, as you saw by the, uh, really the third meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong-un and Pan Jong. I'm not surprised that that happened. Both of them are opportunistic. And it was a signal that it, the opportunity for dialogue is not closed, and since you're here, and since you asked, I'll come down. But only because you asked, Mr. President Trump, will I come down, otherwise I wouldn't come. And so that was a, he's, skillful at signaling. He also overestimates. We haven't studied Kim Jong-un at all, so I know I'm giving you a lot here, but we haven't talked very much about it. No, he, uh, he overestimates sometimes. Uh, he overestimates the degree to which he can control outcomes and has gotten too close on several things and has failed in some things. But remember, he learns in public. He won't, he won't, he's not afraid to fail on things like his dual track policy of military development on one hand and economic development in partnership with it. It's called Byung-jin. He started this several years ago. But he failed because he pursued the military so quickly, believing that nuclear power would give him assurances that would allow him to advance economically. That now he's taken a new course. And part of his reason for com uh, com com having conversation now is because the previous method failed. And he still wants the economic uh, development of North Korea to be the case. And that, candidly, is what he's ultimately after in what we're pursuing at the present time. So don't lose sight of that. It's about the economy, stupid. <laughs> That's the case here also. It's about the North Korean economy while he retains the power to lead that economy forward. Okay, well, there, there's a clue. Watch that space. All right, uh, so in late 2017 and early 2018, we changed course, uh, certainly on the United States side, from what looked like potentially imminent war, remember fire and fury, everybody, to what uh, General Brooks has called the season of symmetry. So what changes took place in the military uh, situation during, during that time? Um, and what was the role of the military commands in what looks to outsiders as more of a diplomatic inflection point? Well, it's, it's really, it's a great case study. Maybe at some point I can capture this, but any future PhD students out there, here's a different thing. It's what we're talking about. It really is quite a study. Yeah. The three commands each had a different role. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll do this as quickly as possible now that you know about the three commands. Okay. U.S. forces had to continue to display uh, determination and deterrence. And so it would send U.S. forces to augment the peninsula, whether it's aircraft carriers or F-35s or bombers, additional forces to come and conduct exercises, and unilateral action. So we showed the unilateral card several times in 2017, mostly done by Indo-Pacific Command, which had the authority to conduct operations outside of war before wartime, and U.S. forces create enabled their operations. Some of those were pretty formidable, and finally shocked North Korea. Okay, so there, many of the things we did <clears throat> because of consistency, North Korea had gotten used to. But one of my staff officers uh, was very erudite and said that 
You know, it's very much like uh, a cat that walks down a street by a yard that has a dog on a dog run. The cat knows exactly how long the chain is, and the dog often forgets that there's a chain. <laughs> and the cat likes to get the dog excited until the dog goes sprinting and barking and yelping until it gets choked back and can't go any further. And in many ways, United Nations commands that dog in partnership with South Korea, and North Korea is a cat, for sure. <laughs> and so our object with U.S. forces was to introduce more dogs in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we did. So we introduced capabilities that he had not seen. We did our own missile launches. He'd launch a missile. We and the South Koreans would launch a missile. Very much like what he's doing right now. Almost identical missiles launched in the almost identical azimuths, but we always did it at the range that would meet the place where he was actually observing a missile launch. That was the range. And we fired out into the sea. But they're watching. So that was U.S. Forces Korea. U.S. Forces Korea was to be very careful about these demonstrations of power to not tip things over and cause North Korea to believe that an attack was in them. Combined Forces Command, as I said, was to hone the edge, to stay sharp, conduct exercises, be visible about that. But we made adjustments in how we approached the exercises in 2017 especially. As the Olympics was beginning to approach in 2018, many countries were concerned about whether they should send a team. It was very important to our ally that they succeed in the Olympics. That needed to happen or their economy might collapse. Of course, they've just gone through a, a tremendous amount of political turmoil up to the beginning of 2017. And so we, we learned to use different levers for our exercise program. Uh, I'm, for one, an, an encourager of not using on-off switches. I think we need to be much more nuanced than that. We need to think about a graphic equalizer with four controls the timing of the exercise, the scope of the exercise, in other words, what you're training on, the communication volume associated with the exercise, how much are you talking about it or not, and the scale, how big is it, compared to previous ones, so that you're sending signals related to consistency. A bigger exercise may send a greater deterrent message, but also could threaten. A smaller exercise in the previous year can show a change in a positive direction, but not walking away from military readiness. So we did that. We actually moved one of our major exercises that was coming in February of 2018 and displaced it, recognizing that we had to make room for that key activity, that international activity, the Olympics, to succeed. And then we did the exercise quietly. We turned the volume off, or set it to zero, I should say, using an equalizer. Did the exercise without fanfare to signal to North Korea that we're willing to talk, but we're not going to be unready. UN Command, then, on the, on the other hand, was a key player in this. Our dialogue with North Korea at the general officer level had stopped. We hadn't had a conversation with them for six years. This is a place where there had been regular meetings in the Truce Village since 1951. And it stopped. And so we couldn't have serious senior level dialogue, mostly because in the advancement of South Korea, South Korea had taken over the the senior member of the Military Armistice Commission, this group that would meet, and North Korea walked away from the table. They only wanted to now meet with the United States. And so we had to carefully figure out how to create the right kind of venue where the senior American of the Military Armistice Commission was the one holding the meeting on behalf of UN Command. And North Korea complained loudly about that. And I exchanged messages back and forth with my military counterparts. And ultimately, they had the word, we'll agree to meet. But after they put us through some, some hoops, you know, so the day of the scheduled meeting, they said, you were there early, we're not coming. <laughs> because their time zone was 30 minutes off from South Korea. That has since changed. But that was the case in 2017. And so they walked away. We didn't get frustrated. We know that's the dance. We said we insulted them back, sent a written message to them, insulted them, and trying to undermine what it is that Chairman Kim Jong-un said he was going to do. And that we were still willing to meet at a time of their choosing, but until they chose, we would not meet. You know, so it's this kind of dance. We would insult each other toward a common point of acceptance. It's like a bad relationship. It's a very bad relationship. It's lasted a long time. So. But ultimately, that led to military dialogue on the margins of creating the season of summer. Tree. It was the United Nations Command that chose or assisted in facilitating the location of the first meeting between President Moon Jae-in of South Korea and Chairman Kim Jong-un, that happened in Panmunjom. You saw these blue buildings 
Those are my buildings. Those are the UN Command buildings painted UN Command colors. And the intervening ones are silver. Those are North Korean buildings. That's where the meetings occur. They walk on a bridge made out of wood. It was painted UN blue. That bridge runs parallel and about 40 yards from North Korea. And we rebuilt the bridge so the two of them could walk side by side. UN Command did this along with the South Koreans to enable dialogue. And ultimately, UN Command pulled its forces out of that area at the desire of the two national leaders so that only their security forces their presidential security forces would be inside of a bubble that we helped to secure on the outside. And it was our side asking for help from US forces that made sure there were no unmanned aerial systems flying over top of it, no potential military hazards in the area, stopped military activity. In other words, UN command drove the other two commands to create the right kind of environment for dialogue to occur. And ultimately, we had a general officer meeting that agreed to let us fly into North Korea. We actually thought about exchanging them right there in Truce Village. <clears throat> but the North Koreans insisted that it not be done there. That it had to be done in North Korea at their main airfield on the East Coast. Same place these missiles have been launched from, by the way. And we flew a U.S. jet aircraft into North Korean airspace at their request. Trust me, it takes guts to do this. All right, You have to take risk if you want to see change. And our air crew flew in there with some agencies the U.S. government aboard including our defense POW and MIA accounting agency. And we recovered 55 boxes of remains. Oh, by the way, that's sovereign US territory flying into North Korea, that US Air Force aircraft, with a US Air Force two-star general, who is the senior person of the Military Armistice Commission of the United States. And he and his counterpart met there, and he said, would you like to come aboard? This is a North Korean three-star general. He says, yeah. And so we carried him into the aircraft and let him look around what the inside of US power looks like. And they, they were impressed, I'll use those words, um, overstated. And then they sat down and talked about their kids. This is way before any national level diplomacy occurred. This is military diplomacy. And as a result, North Korea didn't play a game that day. And they turned over 55 boxes of remains which contains some 190 or so veterans of multiple countries. His colleagues, we've got a veteran up in the back, your, your colleagues, people you serve with, some of those have now been returned to their families in the last several months. This came from military diplomacy for the Wing Command. So I just wanted to highlight all those things as an extraordinary dynamic that's happening behind the scenes, creating traction for dialogue. One more question for me on the same theme of the relationship between force and statecraft, the military and diplomacy. And after this, we're going to turn to questions from the audience. Um, during this period, you were not only the senior military commander in Korea, but for 15 months, the United States did not have an ambassador there. Uh, and so you were essentially the senior United States government official, full stop. How did you formulate your military advice to policymakers while being a policymaker yourself? Mm -hmm. Well, at first, I never presumed to be the ambassador, even though I was a senior US government official. I was absolutely right. We had a sergeant of affairs there, who's now assistant secretary of state and a dear friend, and what an amazing teammate he was. We did not compete with each other, OK, as to who's really in charge. The Department of State was in charge. There's no question about that, OK? And so enabling the secretary of state's work and keeping the Department of Defense informed on that work. By the way, that was reflected in Washington in the relationship between Secretary Mattis and Secretary Tillerson initially, and then between Secretary Mattis and Secretary Pompeo. We wanted diplomacy to lead. Now, so interacting with the countries who were present in Korea, and there are many, for economic purposes, for social purposes, uh, lots of embassies are there. I spent a lot of time talking to ambassadors of other countries. And part of that was facilitated, I always did that in my UN commander role, because I already had a reason to talk to the international community. Monthly, I would hold a meeting of all of those countries that sent forces during the Korean War. So it's a sending state meeting. And I would chair that meeting, and everyone else at the table was an ambassador. And the ambassadors themselves came. You know, rarely did they send a substitute. And I'd give them an update on what was really happening. And it would write feverishly and report back to their country. So we use that as a method to communicate to other countries. Well, this is how it worked during that time. So we never presumed to be the lead, but nevertheless. 
to make sure that we're speaking with a consistent voice from that of the U.S. government. Now that can be challenging. So as a, an Army general, you know, I, I know where the dog run ends for me, and it's on the Virginia side of the Potomac River. Okay, in other words, I've got to be careful about trounc uh, trouncing around with the National Security Council staff, some of your, your, your friends and colleagues where you served before, Will, or at the Department of State, or working policy on my own. So the object was to keep them well informed of what the South Koreans were saying. I'm grateful that I had earned the trust of civilian and military leadership in South Korea and met frequently with the, North, with the South Korean president and even more frequently with his national security advisor and with the Minister of Defense and Minister of Foreign Affairs. So I was meeting with all of them and had a pretty good picture of what they were thinking. And knowing full well that they knew that, and knowing that they were expecting me to help communicate that back, I did. So part of my military advice was making sure that Washington, particularly the Secretary of Defense, had a good idea of what was happening, what was really happening on the wall. And he would then carry it into the international, uh, into the uh, whole government uh, meeting structure. The, the working groups that happened at various levels where staff come together, the deputies meetings where the deputy secretaries of uh, the departments meet, and the principals meetings, as well as the cabinet level meeting when the president himself and vice president will be, will be there. So that whole echelon was pulsating with information that we were sending. And that was the form of advice. Keep you informed. Secondly, it was when I had a military opinion about how the military should be used or where the opportunity was, or things we should or should not do, I said it. The principal to the, to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and to the Secretary of Defense. Uh, a classic illustration of that was uh, there was quite a bit of discussion in the fall of 2017 about our families who were over there, State Department families, defense families who were in Korea, and shouldn't we get them out with an early return of defendants? And what about the other 200,000 Americans who were there? Not military, okay? 200,000 American civilians, family members, business people, students who were there. Because if one begins to move, there's, there's a no double jeopardy clause within the U.S. government. I can't decide to quietly move military families out and then say nothing to our fellow countrymen who are in the same danger. In the meantime, we would conduct exercises on that. You know, we're, we're the military. We practice what we're supposed to do. We don't come to the big game unprepared. And so we would practice even the evacuation of our nationals. Carol did that several times. She always had to have a backpack with enough to survive on to try to get her at least to Japan, if not all the way to the coast of the United States. And we would practice that. So we would have to make military advice on, should we do this exercise now or not? Can we afford to take risk? given the high degree of tension, with North Korea looking very closely for the belly button. Remember, I'm a basketball player. We don't take head fakes. If we do, we get burned. We look at the belly button of the person who's playing in front of you. When that moves, the person's moving. Don't look at head, foot, or hand fakes. When that happened, you know, they were watching our belly button too. And families were the belly button of the United States. And so I, I came on strongly uh, recommending against an early return of dependence or an evacuation of U.S. nationals, as I believe that that would unintentionally tip the table in a way that we would not be able to return from the precipice of war. All right, questions from the questions from the audience. So, okay, so uh, all right, uh, this one right here. Uh, uh, Theo, uh, sorry, it's two steps in front of you there. All right, so good recovery. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've enjoyed this a lot. Uh, just a question, maybe that's a little bit harder to quantify, but how do you feel like the the fact that the U.S. forces, the U.S. command is actually in control of the Republic of Korean forces. How do you think that's influenced, like the domestic, maybe ego, and just also the domestic politics in general in South Korea as compared to other places where we have U.S. alliances? That's a great question. A great insight on that. Uh, it, it has been a a bit of a sign curve on this, so it really depends on which type of political party is in power. Right now, we have a more progressive party that's an alliance. Uh, coalition, if you will, political coalition, and it contains more of the progressives of the society and some of the progressive nationalists. And so they feel that we ought to be hurrying up on transferring control to South Korea, South Korea's preponderance of forces, we can defend ourselves, we know North Korea better than Americans do, 
and the Americans are trampling on our sovereignty. So you'll hear that voice, that's a small voice. Uh, the conservatives who have been in power an equal amount of time, uh, maybe perhaps a little bit more, benefited from a very close relationship with the U.S. military and with the United States government. And they're the opposite voice. It says, we dare not walk away from the United States. Look at our neighborhood. Okay, so you want to look at the top ten militaries. Number three and number seven are outside of Northeast Asia. All the rest of them are in the neighborhood. Okay, until you get down to nine and ten. You get to, to Vietnam, et cetera, and, uh, and, and uh, I guess Turkey. So Turkey's number nine, Vietnam's number ten. These are the largest militaries in the world. Already, South Korea is outnumbered. 620,000 on active duty to 1.x million, as I described, in North Korea. And with the number of systems that are pointed at their capital and in range of cannons, souls in, in range of cannons. 25 million people live in Seoul. It is twice the density of New York City. It's a mega city in cannon range. So the conservatives say, whoa, not so fast. I mean, I got it politically. I, I want to make sure we have sovereignty here, and we'll stand for our sovereignty with the Americans. But don't walk away from the relationship with the Americans. The neighborhood still is not safe. So you have both voices. Uh, I would give President Moon great credit as uh, having been painted as a, a lefty going into government. But he, in fact, is a pragmatist. He really is. And he feels he is swept into power by a popular sentiment, and he pays attention to that popular sentiment and makes a lot of strategic decisions, including that popular sentiment, not based solely upon it, but including that, that popular sentiment. And there is a voice that, that rises from time to time. Uh, sometimes that's led South Korea into some uh, difficult, dangerous, or even mistaken positions. And one of those is a very recent one, this decision so far to not renew the General Security of Military Information Agreement. You'll see that abbreviated as GSOMIA. That's what it's real name is, the General Security of Military Information Agreement, which allows bilateral communication between Japan and South Korea. And for lots of reasons that are deep, uh, deeply uh, rooted in South Korean body, body politic, they chose to step away from that at the present time. And, state that they do not intend to renew. There's a 90-day period before it actually lapses, and the clock is running on that. They still may make a decision to renew if the circumstances are improved, but in the meantime, they're not. So this is really the dynamic that happens inside of their uh, UN command, and I'll make this the last point on this, UN command tends to be the punching bag more often because UN Command is a signatory to the armistice that didn't bring peace to Korea. Sing Man Ri, who was a president supported by the United States, that initial fledgling democracy, uh, was rather angry about the armistice as it was being constructed and refused to sign it. So he didn't want to be a signatory. So UN Command, the Chinese People Volunteers, North Korean People's Army, with Kim Jong-un's grandfather, are the three signatories to them. Which means that the whole relationship is a military one. That's difficult then for a sovereign nation. And so as a result, we were very careful about uh, being sensitive to this feeling of sovereignty and not trampling it with decisions that didn't take into account domestic politics. And one would hope that militaries don't consider that, but at the level I was, there is no separation. There's a primacy but there's not a separation between the two. I would focus on military activity, but always had a mind for what the domestic and international and U.S. political consequences could be. And my advice would include those. So someone else to decide, but it would include them. So for example, and I'll, I'll be really quick about this, I see another hand up. China was sending fishing boats, or allowing fishing boats, the country didn't do this, of course, not the government, but allowing fishing, boat, fishing boats to encroach an area that separates North Korea and South Korea in the waters of what the Koreans call the West Sea and what most maps say is the Yellow Sea. This is really a larger part of China determining that all the seas around China within the nine-dash line are theirs, and so they can fish there if they want to. 
And they went straight toward an area that is governed by the military armistice agreement. It belongs to neither side. It belongs to the armistice commission. And so it became essentially a wildlife sanctuary. Giant crabs, fish, clear water, all sorts of things. And the Chinese fishing boats went straight into it. Most of the time they'd make an agreement with North Korea and North Korea wouldn't fire on them. Neither side likes China. But South Korea had a huge domestic problem because of this. And President Park Geun-hye said, we have to do something about this. And she ordered her military to go in there. And I had to say, sorry ma'am, that is UN and armistice controlled. And what we then, then did to release the political pressure, because all of a sudden the sovereignty question came up, was to create a military operation under UN command's authority. The first one we've done since, uh, since 1968. Oh, I'm sorry, since 1976. They created a UN police force, a maritime police force, that then controlled that area and kept the Chinese out. <clears throat> Within three fishing cycles, there were zero Chinese fishing boats. When I started, there were 390 a day. And what they would do is drop a net that had anchors on it, and then drag it with their boat and pick up everything that was inside. In other words, they were destroying the natural habitat and taking the fish right in front of South Korean fishermen who were not allowed to go into that area because they were obeying the rules. That's the, the kind of thing we tried to do to make sure we were deft about applying the authority of the United Nations Command under this armistice agreement and not trampling sovereignty, but rather trying to help attend to it. Um, next question, uh, Professor slash Colonel O'Connell. So. I'll give you a quicker answer on this one. Thank you, sir. Uh, the U.S. is, is, is rightly regarded as a leader in protecting civilians in armed conflict, yeah. making sure that military violence ends up on combatants, not on non-combatants. But one area where it's come in for some critique concerns anti-personnel landmines and the Ottawa Convention. Um, when pressed on why the United States, along with China and Russia, did not sign the Ottawa Convention to prohibit the use of APLs, the argument was largely organized around the defense of South Korea. So um, I'm just curious your position on this. Number one is, do you believe it's true that the United States cannot defend South Korea without APLs? Which is a summary of the position, much more nuanced, of course, of what the Department of Defense has said over the years. And number two, do you have any comment on the critique that not signing Ottawa and continuing to allow the use of APLs actually gives cover to competitors like Russia and China to continue to manufacture and use weapons that don't discriminate between civilians and combatants? Let me address the latter part first. It's, uh, sometimes I hear this, because we didn't sign, it gives an excuse to some players around the world. They were going to do it anyway. Look at the INF. We signed that. Okay, now we walk away from it. But Russia had long since violated that. And they signed it too. Uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty was signed by North Korea in 1994. In the threat of that, we ended up working through things, ultimately leading to an agreed framework to keep them from walking away. But they still signed it. And so we have these dynamics that are out there. Let me get to the, the, the broader point. The U.S., and I learned this as a, a Brigadier General in the Joint Staff, and I had uh, UN and Multilateral Affairs as my portfolio, as well as the entire Western Hemisphere for military policy. This is a brand new one star. The U.S. can live consistent with treaties without having signed them. The U.S. can even encourage the design and the writing of the treaty that it didn't sign. And we do that frequently. Okay? Especially if there's sometimes an international body that it is easily politically skewed that will then go after the United States in the international community. And suddenly, we'll find ourselves in a Gulliver's travel circumstance, having been tied down by the locution things that we created. Now, I don't mean to sound hubristic about this, but there are places like that where it will happen. Uh, in international tribunal uh, for war crimes are an example of that. In the case of landmines and the Ottawa Treaty, first this creates some tension between us and Canada. In Canada, my deputy commander at UN Command was a Canadian three-star general who was now the head of the, uh, the Canadian Army. And so the positions he would carry back would be very interesting ones. Can we defend without landmines? I, I don't, well, that has been a summarized position, but that's never been a military position. Of course we can. There are limits to military power, and there are risks that you take when you forswear some capability. Believe me, North Korea has mines. We see North Korean mines washing in every monsoon season. 
They'll come washing out of the north. Some of those are old landmines that were put in during the Korean War that have not been recovered. And other ones are ones that North Korea is still using in and around their positions just outside of the demilitarized zone. And the monsoon doesn't care, so it comes washing down. It takes sometimes North Korean soldiers, North Korean barracks, landmines, and we'll find all of them washed into a fence. Seriously. They lose people every year because of this. Well, they don't have a shortage of landmines. The terrain in North Korea is extremely, extremely rugged. Extremely rugged. Okay? Everything is a hill, and there's always another higher hill that's behind it. And so the crenellations and turns, the valleys and things, are very difficult to defend militarily. You can't just do that with direct firepower. And in the case of many of the North Korean sites, they're on the north side of a ridge. You can't even do that with aircraft. You can't do it with artillery. So they have protection by staying on the north side of mountains, believe it or not. And that's where a lot of their sites are, are located. Mines make it possible to not forfeit military advantage when you need it, to shape terrain in a time of conflict. They're not used in armistice. So we live with the conventions of the Ottawa Treaty in armistice, but we haven't forsworn the use of them because of that. Okay. Right, um, right there. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being here and sharing both your personal experience and your expertise. Um, I'm a graduating senior this year. Um, I'm studying international relations, global studies, with a focus in international security in East Asia. I was actually in Japan um, recently when North Korea filed some, uh, fired some of their missiles into the Sea of Japan, and I got that inter international SOS message on my email, so that was pretty interesting to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, so when I heard that you were giving this talk here, I made the very easy decision to miss class in order to hear you. All right, that was worthwhile. As a professor, I'll give you a note of it. <laughs> I can't protect you that. I'm only a fellow. <laughs> So the question I wanted to ask you is in regards to the upcoming 2020 election, yes. um, what are some of the things that you are wanting to hear from candidates in regards to what they think the U.S. security policy should be in the region? Well, I, I would love to hear a very serious dialogue about international relations. I haven't heard. I, I don't care what part you pick. I have not heard a serious conversation about international relations yet. That worries me. Because there is still a sentiment in the United States that could lead us to retrenchment and isolation. And trust me, we have, we have history with retrenchment and isolation. And have grudgingly left isolationist policies, as in the summer of 1941, leaving military commanders six months to prepare for what was obviously going to happen after the Japanese went into Indochina. Look at the history on that. Okay, We had an official policy of isolation non-intervention around the world. Was there intervention happening? Yeah. Lynn Lease had been going for several years because it was clear that we could help without being in. But the reality is the world draws you in, and it's always worse after, after a lack of intervention policy. So I'm not saying we ought to always be interventionist and easy about that. We ought to be extremely thoughtful before we intervene in any of the problems around the world. But being isolated does not protect you from it. It makes it a hell of a lot worse. I use those military terms. That's military advice term. A hell of a lot. <laughs> worse. Look at World War II. Okay? And in to a degree, even World War I, the Great War. The war to end all wars that didn't. So I'm a fan of remaining engaged internationally. I would like to hear candidates say, how are you going to balance that? How do you balance domestic, economic, and social interests, the guns and butter issue, with uh, international relations and military interests? How do you preserve the hard-fought relationships the United States has around the world and the view that we are a leader and the indispensable ally? We're not always the best ally, but we are always the indispensable ally. Most countries will not go into another action without the United States saying that we're with you on this. And, oh, by the way, those that we fight with stand alongside. I spent yes. lots of time with the, the Iraqi Armed Forces uh, with three and a half years in Iraq including during the surge. When it came time for us to begin to reduce our forces, they were bewildered. Is the United States still with them as a country or not? And why would the United States abandon them to political leadership that they didn't trust? What does that then do to civilian control of the military, something we were trying to help them understand? I was asked several times by very senior Iraqi generals, 
If we decide to overthrow our national leadership, will you with us? So we have to be with them in other ways. I want to hear a serious discussion about this. It's very difficult out there in the world right now, and it won't get better by us putting our head in the sand. We've got time for one more question. We'll take this gentleman over here. So Jay Hong's bringing the mic down to you right now. Anytime there's a transition in leadership in high positions, it gives me either fear or anger because we're losing everything that you have brought to the table for our country for a long period of time. How does, and this is a personal question, how does one in your position get to the point of saying, I've had enough and I'm leaving, I'm moving on? Well, First, let me say that's not the condition under which I departed. <laughs> 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 it was Carol who said she had to go. <laughs> she, did, she, she was a tremendous Army child and Army wife, so her whole life has been spent in service to the nation, and so I honor her and respect her for that. But I uh, had been a general for 14 years. That's pretty rare. There's only one other general who's been a general longer than me. He had a month and a half on me, and he's about to join UT also. So we were the two longest serving generals, not the oldest. He was the oldest, <laughs> but the longest serving. If there's a point in time for a military professional when you don't believe that you can continue to serve your duty honorably, the service that you willingly undertook, for whatever reason, you may have a moral, moral ethical reason, you may have a physical energy reason, you may have illness, and many of my colleagues become ill while they're serving because of the degree of stress that they and their families live under. Uh, some of my friends have died from illness, not from combat, as a result of that. But then you may have to say, it's time for me to go. And our nation ought to always say, thank you, whether it's three years, or 38 and a half years, as it was for me. We ought to always say thank you for being that 1% that chose to serve. But generally, it's not out of frustration. It's, it's out of, it's time. So it, it's, it's, there's, there is a great system of continuity in our military. It really is an exemplar for businesses, academic institutions, political bodies to look at. Because we always make sure there's a contact replacement. So my successor and I spent every weekend for four months. It would be really early in the morning for him because he was in North Carolina. It would be really late in the night for me because I was on the other side of the world. And we committed that time to each other for me to exchange every piece of nuance that I could. It's overwhelming for him, obviously, <clears throat> because you have to be in the situation to really understand the information you're receiving. But he wasn't going to go into it cold. And as a result, his glide slope, his ramp for learning, was less inclined than it would have been had he not had the benefit of information. My, my predecessor did the same for me, for friends. We were all four-star generals together. We served in combat together. We grew up together. One was two years in front of me at West Point. The other one was two years behind me at West Point. And so we've known each other since our teens. This is continuity that happens inside the military. Not in every case. It's not quite so close. But the obligation of passing your knowledge, whether you capture it in a book or an electronic file or in a briefing set, and then ensuring your successor has the best benefit of the doubt coming in so that the command, the organization, the institution is what stays sharp. It's not about the individual the institution. So I got to play on the ultimate team of teams. It's all about teamwork. And anyone who deviates from teamwork into selfishness or selfish approaches to their work would have been pushed aside long before. And those who had asked to leave. But for those who were on the team, they were highly experienced in teamwork. And it was a great privilege to do that. So that's how I feel about it. And I, I'm a little less worried about the transitions that come with that. Yes, it's a different personality. Different dynamics come from different personalities. We'll be okay. We got great people. There's a great note to close on. Folks, please join me in thanking you. Morgan.
move things ahead. Uh, this coming Tuesday, five days from now at 12.15 in uh, the, the College of Liberal Arts Building, RLP, we're going to be hosting Andrew Peake, who is uh, the State Department's top official on Iran policy. So if 